Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the second GLP webinar on co-production in the field of land system science. My name is Isabel Providoli. I work at the International Program Office of the Global Land Program, which is based at the Center for Development and Environment of the University of Bern. This webinar is hosted by GLP, supported by the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. I will be moderating this webinar jointly with my colleague Jean-Christophe Castella from IRD CIRAT in France. But before we start, I would like to provide an overview of the webinar series. I'm not sure if you can see my slide. Yes, here we go. So um, we had the first webinar in June. It was an introductory webinar setting the stage about co-production in the field of land system science. And now we will start with three webinars which are illustrating practical examples about the use of different methods for co-production. And these examples were actually chosen based on a survey we did at the end of the first webinar. So today we will start with the first one about adaptive landscape approaches using role-playing games. And this webinar will then be followed by two other ones, one about modeling, scenario building and forecasting, and another one about the use of spatial tools. So this series of practical examples will be, then be followed by a fifth webinar, and that's actually a synthesis where we jointly elaborate a change theory for co-production of sustainable land systems. And the results of all this uh, webinar series will then be presented in a breakout session at the GLP Open Science meeting next year. But so before we start today's webinar, I would like to give the floor to Lauren Hertel, who will share with us some housekeeping rules. Hello everyone, this is Lauren Hertel from the Global Land Project. I just wanted to let you know a couple of things going into this. So first off, we um, have everyone's microphones muted. There are already over 50 people in attendance on the webinar, so we want to make sure to avoid hearing extraneous sounds, um, people typing in the background, maybe eating a sandwich. So your microphones will stay muted during the webinar. Um, but you can ask questions at any time during the webinar, and we hope that you will. We encourage lots of questions. Um, by using the question feature within GoToWebinar, you also have the ability to use the chat window if you would like to send a message to any of us individually or to all the organizers or even to the entire audience. Um, that said, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our first presentation, Isabel. Right. So uh, thank you, Lauren. So now I would like to give the floor to Jean-Christophe uh, Castella from IRD CIRAT, and he will give an introduction to the webinar. So please, uh, Jean-Christophe, the floor is yours. So, uh, hello everybody. So uh, I like to introduce the I'd like to introduce the, the talk with uh, this participation uh, ladder that most of you already know about. Um, it's the, the increasing level of participation that we, we uh, develop in our, in our research from uh, not involving the, the stakeholders at all to uh, engaging them into, into action. And the, the level where we are located uh, in our um, co-design, co-production um, uh, webinar is uh, uh, on, at the top of the, of the scale um, and is combining a, a number of uh, approaches uh, that would bring us from uh, engaging into the discussion with the stakeholders to uh, acting together, to co-decision and acting together. So it's larger than uh, the, the step uh, uh, pointed as uh, uh, co-design. 
And most of the time we use these approaches to deal with unstructured problem, with a wicked problem, some other people say, uh, with a low degree of consensus and a lack of scientific certainty that require more participation from the, the stakeholders. And then the, the role play games are used in this context uh, to, to better understand the system, to engage in transformation of the system, or to enable an environment that would support those transformation. And so that's the, the, the area where we, we intervene. Here, I, I, as you see, I present different ways of uh, playing around with, uh, with wheels. Um, and uh, from learning how, how to, uh, to, to use a wheel, what a wheel is, uh, uh, to uh, use how to learn how to drive a, a car from uh, this first uh, 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 training and then uh, when you reach a stage uh, where you engage with a large number of uh, of people then you can design your own car uh, to go further and in when we engage in uh, in uh, land system analysis and uh, land system transformation it's a little bit the, the, the same process that we go through from trying to to uh, learn how how things work to engage together in, in, uh, in uh, actually changing uh, things on the ground. And for this, we, we need to learn about uh, each other, to learn how to work together, how to develop collaboration. We have to, to uh, integrate different scales to uh, uh, understand the, the local context, to uh, uh, test together first virtually and then in reality, innovative uh, strategies and then to, to uh, co-design uh, policy measures so that we can uh, engage in a meaningful transformation of the, of the landscapes. And so this require, you will see in, in, the, in the subsequent presentation, learning loops. So we go from uh, understanding the, the, the system to um, um, simulating uh, what may happen if we will do things, then we do those things that we analyze the impact and then we enter into a new loop of uh, um, um, learning. And so today to illustrate the use of uh, role-playing games with uh, concrete examples, we will uh, have uh, three successive presentation, one from uh, Christine Honest Muller, who will uh, present the use of uh, um, role-playing game for understanding uh, land system changes. Then I will do a presentation on how we use the, these tools to engage community into transformative landscape uh, approaches. And uh, Claude will uh, then uh, present how uh, his experience in using this, uh, these tools in uh, informing uh, policies. And so now I, I would like to, uh, to uh, hand over the, the microphone to, uh, to Christine, uh, with whom I, I had a chance to collaborate on the on the ground in uh, in uh, Laos for for a few months, and um, so she will uh, uh, present her, her experience there. Thank you, Jean Christophe. <clears throat> um, so uh, yes, quickly introducing myself. Um, um, I'm Christina Oetzmüller. I'm uh, by background a geographer, uh, Austrian. And I've been uh, doing a PhD or completing now my PhD in land system science at the FU University in Amsterdam. And there I've been busy, busy with um, improving land system models in the way how they uh, represent human dimensions, among them also um, human decision making. And um, in, throughout the course of my PhD, I got uh, to across companion modeling. Uh, so I um, attended the training in which I learned how to design, design games myself um, with, with others and then was connected to Jean-Christophe uh, for a certain project uh, through which we could harness the two and build a new methodology combining games for different purposes. And um, the result of this is what I'm going to present now. Um, I'm going to give you just a brief introduction to the land use change process that we um, investigated together, but mostly I will focus on describing what uh, the multiscale gaming methodology is 
and I will also discuss the methodology a little bit, uh, give you a few of the insights uh, that we could um, come to uh, in this co-produced uh, way. So a little bit about the land use change process. Um, in Laos, um, there has been a phenomenon just like in other uh, regions of the world where there was a, a boom of a certain cash crop. You can identify such a boom um, by seeing a very fast, very rapid uh, increase of a certain crop um, in a landscape. Um, so fast paced, very high magnitude and um, in the case of Laos, this led to certain uh, consequences um, of the land to the land system. So on the one hand, um, cash crops, as it says, cash, um, uh, it brings up uh, wealth, over uh, average wealth, but at the same time, uh, it also causes um, quite rapid land degradation, soil erosion. Um, in this case here, you can also see it. Uh, <clears throat> the erosion leads to an influence to another, uh, to paddies, uh, um, which get clogged by all the soil uh, that is um, ending up in the paddies. So you have an interaction within the landscape um, that is affected. Um, there is a deforestation happening um, and the socioeconomic system is also transformed because even though if on average uh, the wealth is increasing, at the same time uh, inequality and indebtedness is also um, increasing. So it's a rapid change and what leads to it is somehow like larger uh, contextual factors um, of the region, but at the same time also uh, the, the smallholders themselves decide to engage in maize, uh, maize cropping. So we looked into the decision making of it. And if you uh, look at this map here, you can see that um, this phenomenon is sort of uh, happening across the country. So it's not only very local, but at the same time, it does uh, appear in certain places much more pronounced. Uh, you have certain clusters of uh, these um, maize boom. Here. So the challenge uh, we are having to understand this land, uh, land system change is to have a methodology on both zooming in and understanding the decision makers to, uh, to get into their, like how it is to be the decision maker themselves, understand the context, what brings them to decide for engaging in a maze boom that is actually quite detrimental to their own land system. Um, but at the same time, we need to have something that helps us to zoom, zoom out all this, what we learned. And um, this was the challenge from which we started and we knew of the power of uh, games in um, representing and exploring context, but we also thought, uh, okay, we need to somehow scale this up. And that's, if you put fast forward um, several months later, we, we had developed uh, and applied the multi-scale gaming approach in a way that we are combining games uh, for different purposes. So this is a slide uh, that will come up more often. I will walk you through it. Um, but essentially what you um, um, can like take as a guidance is it's, it's like three major steps uh, where we start at the regional level. We select field sites that we know are in a maze boom, that we know are in a certain decision phase. Then we go into uh, these places uh, for uh, uh, in a local level um, and um, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure I, I probably can sorry about that um, here we are okay I need to just okay well whatever um, so we are going through this from the regional scale to the local scale and then uh, go up again to the re uh, to the regional scale. So it is a phases of uh, contextualization and generalization that we are uh, going through when applying a series of methods uh, that have uh, games as the fundamental part of it. So let's dive into it. Um, the field site selection uh, we made was also done in a participatory way. 
uh, we invited agricultural experts who were working in the Efficas project that were was dealing with with the maize boom villages with 44, and we mapped them out along a, a gradient of land degradation and market integration, in order to find out uh, at what stages are are these uh, villages um, probably now in, so that we can select some that really fulfill uh, help us to understand each decision phase from adoption, expansion to abandonment. Um, and um, we mapped them out and selected seven out of them um, that could represent a bit the diversity of the backgrounds as well. So we have both upland and lowland uh, areas and we have uh, four different provinces so that we also can see a little bit the different policies uh, and different other access factors. So into from the selection, we then went into uh, doing field uh, survey, or uh, which is um, a focus group. In, in every village, we had first a focus group, then interviews, and then designed, based on the information that we got from the earlier two stages, a local game. We did that through all of the seven villages. Now let's look into uh, how that looks like in one of in each of the villages. We have a start. We start with collecting historic uh, like contexts that tell us something about the history uh, of the village, uh, for which we invited the village committee and the um, knowledgeable um, pioneers and maids. Um, we then um, used this to also have a few, in few more interviews on an individual level. Um, and that also helped us to then define a research question. So where is the village right now at? What, what is the most relevant thing for them uh, so that we could really explore the decision at the moment when it is happening. Um, around with all that knowledge, we then designed a series of games, or so you can see me here in uh, one of the des design phases it, uh, in a very short time. And then the next day, uh, we mostly played it with uh, selected or with, with, uh, with the selection of uh, villages. Around 12 people were. So this uh, is a bit showing the variety of games. Um, it will, it's some of them were played more often because uh, most many of them were a bit similar in their decision phase. Uh, we explored investments from maize revenues, uh, then also a land degradation in particular, how to deal with it, but also what would be alternatives that uh, people would um, choose for. Um, and after finishing all these. Uh, local games in which we explored uh, and tried to understand the, the context for for the, uh, smallholders. We then uh, used we formed a meta game, so a game about the games, that helped us to uh, to express our system understanding that we could get, and at the same time to test and to validate it. So this is. <clears throat> more or less the system understanding on um, the factors that you see here are what we think throughout time are changing and are influencing the smallholders so from a smallholders perspective uh, this these are kind of the factors that influence them throughout the, the boom uh, these are more or less the underlying model for the design of the game which we then played with not farmers but agricultural uh, experts to who know a bit about the process uh, and what we got from this, um, this also enabled us to test whether the, the, the more or less uh, assumptions that we make here or the generalized knowledge is really playing out for them as well. So we would uh, check in, these are the results of it. And indeed, we had a uh, similar form of um, people uh, choosing for maize, depending on how, here you can see how the factors change, we also uh, changed the factors here. So it was more like also a bit more experimental type of, of a game. And uh, the last element was that we called for debriefing. We invited some observers uh, who are also researchers. And we also invited the participants to let us know whether they think as well, uh, we represented the knowledge that they have as well. So it, it, it enabled us to, to share our different uh, system understanding views. These are some of the uh, co-produced insights. Um, 
Um, so overall, <clears throat> we found out that um, most of the environmental trade-offs, so these uh, land degradation, deforestation, are kind of uh, invested uh, in order to reach uh, long-term socioeconomic goals, such as escaping poverty, uh, the education of children, or getting to a more secure uh, uh, land use, such as uh, growing paddy rice, that also is less uh, worksome. Then uh, another interesting observation we made is that um, yeah, uh, there's probably a imitation behavior uh, that is taking place. So people rather look to others on how they make a decision in order to form their, their decision. So there's a very a strong social component, so, um, immediate context to, to their decision that they actually take. And um, also the key factors that I showed you earlier just before um, that are changing over time is very likely uh, leading decision makers uh, to go for a, yeah, to, to engage in a MISPO. Now, what are, what are the uh, advantages and limitations of a multi-scale gaming approach? Um, on the one hand, um, it, uh, it is an empirical method to, uh, to look at a sequence of decisions that are one decision is mostly based on an earlier decision, so so they create a context for each other. And um, a recent uh, meta study found out that most of the land use decision making studies only look into one decision in isolation, which very often probably leaves out a lot of context. Then um, another advantage is that it uh, helps to frame uh, system understanding. So it helps to operationalize, to make it very concrete in the uh, rules, roles, resources, and to really make the narrative that we gain as researchers during our own field work to make it uh, explicit. Um, then it, the games, playing the games, these sessions help us to validate the system understanding that we kind of had operationalized before. And at the same time, it's also a quite different way to engage with uh, scientific or non-scientific stakeholders uh, because they themselves become uh, farmers and it lets them understand the, um, the system from a, from a quite different perspective, uh, which is uh, very often um, goes into a deeper memory than a cognitive presentation, so to say. If you compare it to other methods, um, uh, one of the limitations is uh, that it is um, not possible to really make meaningful statistical tests because the the number of participants in a game session are um, mostly around up to 10, maximum 15. So there's statistical tests are not very meaningful on the outcomes. Uh, and um, well, uh, I think what was really beneficial in that research is that uh, uh, Jean-Christophe had already quite some prior knowledge about about these uh, changes in a prior uh, network to make it uh, happen uh, in such a meaningful way. So <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to go much more in depth in the discussion, but I wanted to use this to particularly describe what it is and then we can maybe also um, discuss particularly the co-production elements of it. Uh, in the upcoming minutes, if you want. Okay, thank you very much, Christine, uh, for your very interesting presentation. We will now, <clears throat> excuse me, no, move to the question and answer session, which I will be moderating. And uh, Lauren might uh, remind us again um, that uh, there you are able to submit your questions. Uh, I hope you are able to find the question box. Um, so while questions are slowly coming in, um, I would maybe start uh, with one question from my side. Um, mm -hmm. So you were explaining you started the games uh, with the villagers first uh, in different villages. Um, I would be interested to hear how did um, how open were the villagers to such games, or were they interested, or did you have to convince them in a way? Maybe you can just share 
some experiences you had and then maybe just a small addition in which language um, were you working with the villagers? Mm -hmm. Thanks Isabel. Um, so <clears throat> overall um, it was not too difficult to get to to have people participate. Um, I think that John Christoph perhaps uh, can also say something about that because um, you know the cultural context very much but um, I think that it helped to first have a focus group with uh, start with inviting uh, the village uh, committee and to send out the invitation through the village committee so that they were inviting actually uh, the, the individual households and um, that worked very well so we had very few cancellations and um, even though I mean people I think didn't know very much at the beginning what they would expect they were at throughout um, you know um, quite happy to, to participate and also making fun, having fun and uh, it was not a very big issue in the Lao, in the Lao cultural context. To your second question, <clears throat> um, so I'm not speaking Lao unfortunately but Jean Christophe does. So the facilitation directly was mostly done with uh, Jean Christophe, uh, another translator, um, come on um, and uh, one of uh, always an agricultural extension agent. Uh, the translator um, helped me to translate immediately back, so I would uh, could also, um, you know, ask questions that would then be translated again. But the the main uh, language was Lao Lum, uh, the the most common uh, language in Laos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so let me see or pick some questions which are um, coming in. Uh, one question is, um, how much uh, of the structure of the games did you develop um, before you started with the work in the field sites? Nothing. So Nothing. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't uh, prepare any game beforehand. We made it on the spot. Um, okay. But um, what I also must say that is that um, Jean Christophe has quite uh, some experience on developing games. So uh, we were also not aiming at making the perfect game. Um, we were aiming at something that helps us to 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 get into talking with the villages about the particular decision, so so they could explain us what the contexts were. So it was not meant to be. Uh, it was rather simple, simple tools, and that's why it was also possible to do that on the spot. Yeah, but we took all the equipment with us, of course, so we were uh, prepared to do games beforehand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, another question is: um, I read it for you. I mm -hmm. assume the group was not equal in terms of assets, gender, knowledge, and so on. I was wondering if you encountered power-related issues maybe dominance of some uh, people and if so how did you deal with that if some people were very dominant so i assume that uh, with group uh, you mean the participants of the local games yes or... i assume it's at the village you had a, a mixed group of people and how did you deal with it if some were very dominant maybe taking the yeah. decision for the others well, um, on the one hand, um, uh, we were trying to to start from uh, how we uh, selected the sample of households. Uh, we used a survey that was done just one year before in order to find out about uh, household uh, characteristics such as um, the socioeconomic status. So we had we tried to select with a principal component analysis. Uh, the main to, to, to capture the, the spectrum of types of households that there were from poor to rich from uh, petty owners to only uh, shifting cultivators um, and based on that we would uh, invite the household head which in the Lao uh, context is mostly male uh, we did have we did try to uh, 
um, also talk to not only these households, but also involve, um, for example, the women's group to, to ask them about their role. And we would talk to, uh, uh, yeah, we would also kind of try to debrief a bit um, how, the, how the decisions are made. Uh, uh, in the household and um, um, that was sometimes a bit difficult but um, how do you say well we know that for example male, male uh, household no okay the household heads are mostly male uh, we would also invite women's representatives uh, and some of them were also outspoken we would try to get them in, but it was not always easy to let them directly come to the game themselves because, yeah, it is uh, culturally uh, mm -hmm. uh, defined. So um, we recommend to to look at this when uh, specifically when 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 applying this methodology again to very be kept very careful in selecting participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So. Um, we will actually now uh, be moving to our second speaker. So I would like to invite uh, Jean-Christophe uh, Castella. He will be speaking for engaging communities into transformative pathways. Um, so please, uh, Jean-Christophe, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I have to click on the button mm -hmm. somewhere. It should come. Yeah, I don't see how to click. Um, and here I am. <laughs> OK, my, uh, so I, I will uh, tell you about my, my story uh, in uh, Laos, where I spent the last uh, 10 years. Uh, after having worked in, uh, in Southeast Asia on, on similar topics for most of my professional life, um, and over the last 10 years, I've been uh, working on engaging farming communities in transformative landscape approaches uh, using a, a large range of uh, uh, tools and um, among them, the role playing games. And I like to, uh, to tell you uh, about this, uh, this story um, that uh, in, in the case of uh, um, uh, land use planning uh, started in 2010 uh, when we realized that uh, le le participatory land use planning was becoming the, the um, um, main uh, instrument of the land allocation policy of the, the Lao government. And uh, they used to uh, apply uh, land use planning, but it was uh, up to then not uh, considered as uh, participatory enough. And so they wanted to uh, increase the level of participation. And when we did uh, the diagnostic, stu diagnostic study in, in 2009, 2010, we realized that indeed it was not very participatory. So that's why we engage in uh, action research uh, in land use planning that I will, I will uh, present uh, later on. And then we, went into a, a, a long phase of uh, extension, expansion of our approach and then consolidation into policy uh, for a, a broad uh, scale uh, implementation. Then in 2014, we realized that uh, uh, even though uh, people did participate in the planning phase, uh, they were kind of uh, concerned by a number of uh, obstacles in implementing. So they, they had a nice map, uh, nice projection about the, the land use they, they wanted, uh, but with a, a large number of uh, obstacles in implementing these uh, changes that they had uh, uh, planned for. And so we... Um, uh, search uh, um, um, how to support uh, these processes through a, a project that is called uh, Eco-Friendly Intensification of Climate Resilient Agricultural Systems, the EFICAS project. And I will present you the, the, the game that we develop in, in that uh, uh, projects to engage with, uh, with the local population in learning loops and, and uh, um, over a period of uh, four years. 
So first, I, I show again this, uh, these wheels um, because it's important to, we, we think uh, we, we were dealing with uh, uh, shifting cultivators in those uh, remote Lao villages who have never been involved in, uh, in uh, land use planning uh, in their in in their life, so I mean, we what we propose is an exercise uh, that is is quite complicated. It's like uh, asking someone who has never learned how to drive to take the wheel and then go. Um, in that case, they they really have to learn the, the basics of uh, of uh, planning and and uh, we, which is uh, far beyond what they they, they used to do. Um, in in uh, in their their real life, and so what we did was to develop a a game uh, that would train them on a virtual environment about uh, uh, planning land use, what it means to plan for the world community, and not planning uh, uh, individual uh, activities. So we did first on a, on on a game board, and then later on we once uh, people. Uh, were comfortable enough with the, the principles of planning, we engaged them in delineating uh, land, land, land zones on a 3D model that was representing their village. And then we, we uh, end up with, uh, with a map of their village that became a, a land use plan. So it was a kind of long process of uh, uh, engagement of our, our partners in, in, the, in planning. And through that process, that learning process, we, we uh, also discuss a number of scenarios that, that were happening in reality there uh, when um, uh, land concessions, for example, were proposed by, by uh, investment companies in the, uh, in the area or when uh, uh, carbon sequestration scenarios uh, were uh, developed as part of uh, Red Plus uh, projects. So we were try to train to uh, train uh, uh, shifting cultivators in those remote villages in uh, uh, dealing with those uh, uh, changes that would uh, happen uh, uh, in the future. And then we were, were uh, discussing with them about how they would handle this or that uh, event. And then at, at the, uh, they were knowledgeable enough about the, the process. We were engaging with them into the, the actual landscape, their actual landscape uh, on the 3D model first. And then uh, uh, we we're planning to engage them uh, into the, the, the real landscape, into, in, into concrete actions. And so what we were doing basically uh, in the process of land use planning is to discuss with them about uh, the, the trade-offs uh, between different objectives. One was the economic uh, objective of, of uh, increasing the, the, the economic resources at the village level. And the other one was uh, to, to preserve the, the environment, to uh, maintain a, a reasonable uh, uh, area of uh, forest in the environment and biodiversity. And so they were kind of... Um, uh, compromising different kind of uh, landscape composition and discussing uh, round after round of the of the game until they they would uh, uh, agree on uh, on one uh, kind of landscape. So they they would then basically uh, start from their current landscape that you see here at the the bottom left of the the figure, and and then uh, the projecting. Uh, a future landscape uh, round after round of uh, negotiation during the during the game that would fulfill a number of uh, of their uh, expectation but then the the big issue was for us how to to uh, get back to the reality once you have uh, decided about uh, which landscape you you want how you get from the current situation through which uh, steps there are many pathways that would bring you to the to, to the the desired uh, landscape and so what we we were doing was to uh, uh, 
uh, assign a number of action, a number of plans to each compartment of the, the, the land use uh, plan and to say, okay, here permanent crop, this is what we will do. Here on the, the plantation area, we will go for coffee, castor bean or, or, or tea. Uh, here, this is what we will do. And then the, we would uh, engage the extension services together with the, the village community to follow up on, on our uh, plans. And we realized after some time that uh, not much was, uh, was happening because uh, these um, different compartments of the, of, of the village uh, landscape were managed uh, uh, somehow uh, disconnected. Uh, and if we wanted to, uh, to uh, uh, move on, we had to consider it as a system and, and deal with the interactions between uh, compartment of the landscape. And so this is what we, we, we did uh, since 2014 in a number of uh, uh, villages. We're working in, in uh, 12 uh, villages in, the, in three provinces of uh, northern Laos. Um, and here I take the example of this uh, village that started with a very small spot trying to, to test something for, for a few uh, farmers. And then uh, year after year, they expanded the area they uh, engage more in the in the process of uh, ma managing their resources but because we were um, dealing with uh, not only uh, one compartment of the of the landscape but but all components of the landscape the livestock system the the, the crops the, the the forest on the top the the, the river uh, that goes across it and then every year we were renegotiating the the plan for the for the next year so it was a kind of learning pathway that we engage with uh, with farmers and that we supported through a, a game that we call the 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 efficas game that we developed to to explore alternative pathways year after year with the the, the local villagers and and uh, discussing about the conditions of implementation of these different uh, options that they were discussing uh, both individually and, and in the community and then we had to convince every individual households of the benefits that they they, they would have uh, in engaging into the into the the collective game so the, this is the, a, a short description of the game itself with a, a game board, uh, eight participants, four men, four women in each uh, session. We use uh, money for, for, to, to uh, um, get an income from the, the activities that the, the players uh, develop. And then the, the labor force of each player is represented by uh, beans that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that you can see on the, on the board. Fences, because uh, the animals are roaming all around, so people needed to fence their, their landscape if they wanted to prevent uh, uh, anim roaming animal to uh, damage the, the neighboring fields. And, and then, uh, so the animals were represented also on the on the board, uh, and then people could compute their their uh, results uh, and check if they uh, their strategy would complement each other. Um, so we use also color cards for the different land use uh, types, uh, both the traditional land use types, and then we try to introduce innovative uh, systems that people could develop to better manage their resources. Each player uh, selected uh, the land use based on the uh, expected income and the uh, available labor force. Then after each round, we were uh, drawing dice that would uh, uh, account for the, the risk that uh, uh, people uh, face every year uh, in relation with uh, livestock disease, with uh, weather uh, events, uh, damage of uh, roaming animals, uh, and so on. And then at the end of each round, the, the players will receive the money for their actions. Um, we were monitoring the whole thing uh, using a very simple uh, Excel file 
uh, that would allow us to uh, to see round after round. They were uh, like uh, five or six rounds, depending on the on, on the on the villagers, um, to to uh, look at the land use changes. So we were monitoring what what was going on in the in the game. And so what happened uh, um, during these uh, uh, participatory uh, interactions was that we, we were discussing about the, the risk of land degradation uh, associated with different practices, uh, both individual and, and collective. We were discussing about the, the risk of uh, crop failure, uh, depending on the, uh, on, on the, um, how the uh, landscape uh, uh, mosaic was uh, was organized and then we propose uh, alternative uh, practices like introduction of legume crops or, or um, changes in uh, management of the livestock so we propose uh, improved pasture we propose different uh, ways to uh, manage the livestock and from one village to the other the the pathway were completely different um, people were were very much adaptive and and they show their their capacity to uh, to develop their own uh, local solutions to the to the the problems and there were uh, very few village that did the same i mean they they were all in the playing the 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 real situation of their village this is what we realized uh, at the end of the game when we were debriefing collectively and we were analyzing the the, the trade-offs between the the, the, the short-term decision on on uh, whether or not to grow hybrid maize, for example, uh, like uh, uh, Christine presented before, or uh, or, or doing other uh, activities. The conclusion we we got from uh, from that uh, process uh, of uh, engaging. Uh, communities in, in the transformative landscape approach is one that we need to find ways to engage the whole village community, not only the eight players uh, that we learn from and will learn from, uh, from us in the, in the process. And so by playing the, the, the game and, and meeting again and again every year, uh, um, through different uh, participatory approaches, we managed to engage the, the, the world community, and that's very important if we really want to, to move on in the implementation of this, uh, these approaches. It's also very important to, uh, to uh, secure the local ownership of the, of the community. So including the, the local elite, but also the, the, the um, poor farmers that who very often are forgotten when uh, engaging into this, uh, these processes. Because uh, if those people, for example, do not tend their animals, uh, they would uh, prevent the whole village to, to, to change their, their system. So really everyone has to uh, agree on the, on, on, on the rules of the game as they emerge uh, after the game. And then uh, what is very important, it requires the, the extension agent and, and uh, the people who, who are engaged in that process to uh, change their uh, way of dealing with uh, local people. They should uh, deal as uh, facilitators uh, and not as uh, lesson givers or expert uh, prescriber uh, who uh, come and and uh, and deliver their reality. They really should uh, uh, facilitate a bottom-up process. So that's one of the uh, lessons we we learn from that process. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Christophe. So also here we will now open the floor um, for questions. Um, so please write it uh, into your chat box. I think we will have time for one or two questions. Um, so there we have a question. Um, what was the level of participation of the communities on the game design? Um, 
in fact, initially we de we developed the game with uh, with the communities. Uh, what happened is that we we started from uh, from almost nothing, from just our knowledge of the of the local situation, and before we, uh, I mean. To, to develop the both the parameters and how the game uh, run, we uh, uh, worked with uh, in, directly in some villages. It was a little bit tough for the first villages because we were kind of uh, co-designing the the game with them. Um, so it was a kind of a lengthy process. But uh, it was very useful because uh, uh, the, the local people were uh, really pushing for what was important to them, uh, both in terms of uh, what should be represented in the game, uh, what the constraints are, and uh, what was the level of the parameters. So we uh, co-designed the game in, in uh, three successive villages that were quite different before we, we would then apply it in a, in a more stabilized way in uh, subsequent villages. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, here we have another question. How many land users uh, did you have uh, per capita land area? Uh, you mentioned you are in shifting cultivation areas, so I guess they're not very populated, right? But could you maybe give an indication Yes, uh, the, the villages where we, we worked were uh, around f between 50 and uh, and 100 households. Yeah. So okay. it's not, not big villages. Um, and uh, that's also one of the reasons why uh, we could use our uh, method. Uh, we have other um, examples of uh, uh, villages where uh, we work with uh, larger villages with uh, like uh, more than 300 uh, households. And then we have to uh, somehow uh, uh, mobilize other tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's take one final uh, question and then we will move to our uh, last speaker. So the question is, did you proceed to an ex post evaluation of the methods, including evaluation from communities? Um, in fact, we, we are doing a, a long term monitoring of these communities. Um, I, I told you about the, the, um, the game as a, a way to engage with, uh, with villagers. It was also a, a way for us to uh, um, assess uh, what villagers have, have learned uh, on the way. What we, we've done is that we, had, we selected uh, 12 uh, pairs of villagers, one village where we, we uh, w engage with uh, farmers in the, the changes and one village that was control village. And after uh, three years, we played the game in, in both the, the intervention village and the control village. And uh, through the game, we were also assessing uh, what had uh, people learned in, uh, in the process of engaging into the transformative approach as compared to, to villagers where, where we were just playing the game, not engaging them into the, the transformative approach. So the game is, is itself a, a tool to assess uh, how people learn uh, in the process. Um, now we, we have uh, just uh, finished the, that work and uh, I'm going next month for a new round of, uh, of data collection. So it's ongoing. We're still collecting data to, uh, to, to monitor that process. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Christophe. So now um, we will move to our third speaker. It's uh, Claude Garcia. He's also from CIRAT and the Department of Environmental System Science of ETH Zurich in Switzerland. So please, Claude, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let's see if this works now. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Fair enough, thank you. So, um, good morning, good afternoon. I don't know where the, the, where the, the audience is. So, my name is Claude Garcia and I, work, I have three hats actually. So, the one from CIRAD, 
um, the one at ETH, where I lead a research group called FODE for Forest Management and Development. And the last one is Inspire, which is a company we just created that is actually providing the support, the kind of support that we're going to talk here, not only to communities or to uh, for academics, but actually for people that need to deal with complexity and take decisions about uncertain future. Um, so Christine told us about how you can engage with games to better understand the strategies of individuals in communities. Jean-Christophe showed how you can actually take an entire community by the hand so that you can help them shape the landscape. And it is my task to show maybe what we can do at the other end of the spectrum. How can we use games to also change policies? Um, and I will be focusing on one example uh, of what we did um, one year ago, actually. So these are all the problems or all the words that are relevant to the kind of approaches. And you can see that one of the big one is wicked problems. Jean-Christophe uh, already referred to that. These are problems that people disagree about what the problem actually is. And games are specifically useful in these kind of contexts. Um, so if you follow the two presentations, if you if you are aware of this field, then you understand or um, have heard already that we think games can help to bring about transformations and to improve sustainability. But, but one of the questions people always ask whenever we present this method is, hang on a second, fair enough, this is a game, hmm, it's happening in a village with a few people, really, what are you changing? Um, and, and this is a question that is asked to the entire community of people developing these games. Um, we're not the only ones. Uh, um, there is, the method is already has 15 years um, and other groups have also simultaneously using these methods of this approach. It's called companion modeling, showing how we can bring about change and what kind of change, what happens in a game, is a very tough question and a very tricky question. Um, I will walk you through one specific example. What you see here in the screen now is an intact forest landscape. And this is an ecologist speaking. Intact forest landscape is something new on the map. Well, new, it was created, it's a concept that was created or coined in 2008, so 10 years ago, by academics working on understanding what's going on on the forest. They defined an intact forest landscape um, as an area. Um, it, it's very precisely defined. Um, you can find information about that on Google. Um, I, I not go into the details, but the point is academics put on the map a new concept, a new object called intact forest landscape. And this created a lot of interest within the, the research community, but also with the people that are managing landscapes. We, If you've heard about what is the importance of roadlessness, and making sure that there are spaces left without human presence, then you are interested in the discussions about intact forest landscape. So the concept appears in 2008, and um, a few years later, a body such as the FSC, you recognize the logo, um, um, they are the main, well, there are two big uh, certifying agencies about forest management, FSC is one of the main ones. Um, so in 2014, FSC in the General Assembly voted uh, and took on a motion to say the concept of intact forest landscape is important enough that we, as managers of forest, will take it on board. And from now on, the criteria for intactness, for roadlessness, is going to become part of the criteria we look at when we are dealing with FSC certified concessions. So it's a it's, it's a story of how academics put something on the map and then it's taken on board by, um, um, by civil society and by the companies that are, uh, in this case, managing forests. Except that um, that was only the beginning of the process. Um, let's look at the, these started discussions in, in Siberia, in Canada, in Brazil, and in Central Africa. Um, and this is where I'll be focusing. Um, we'll be looking at the, the logging concessions in Central Africa and specifically FSC logging concessions in Central Africa, where the landscapes could look like that. So you see, you recognize roads and rivers 
and in between you have intact forest landscapes which might be logged. The thing is that um, the main driver of the loss of intact forest landscapes in the Congo Basin is logging. Selective logging, it's not clear cut, it's selective logging needs roads to get the crews in and the logs out. Certified concessions are places where roads are being built, well designed and well planned, but still built. And therefore, in certified concessions, intact forest landscapes disappear. Uh, in this diagram, what you can see is what is actually driving the loss of intact forest landscapes, depending on the continent. And as you can see, in Africa, it's by far logging the main driver. So on one hand, logging is creating the loss of intact forest landscapes in Central Africa. On the second hand, FSC decided they wanted to take, uh, to take steps and to protect that. So FSC and specifically the program, the program for the Congo Basin um, organize um, a discussion uh, between, between experts and stakeholders to define what these uh, rules would look like. Essentially, logging companies were saying, if we stop logging, if we protect entirely intact soil landscape, our entire business plan is dead. And our only option, if we are to survive being an operator and logging for us, is to get out of FSC, which is a lose-lose situation for everybody. So FSC assembled um, a team of experts. They, they screened 300 experts and uh, they identified 12 experts represented, representing the four big bodies, logging companies, governments, conservation NGOs, and representatives of local communities. And their task was to define what, I, what IFL would mean in the rules of FSC. They started that process, they put a lot of money into it, they met often, and it lasted for two years. The problem is that at the end of these two years, they had not reached an agreement. The companies wanted something, the government wanted something else, the conservation NGOs were wanting still something something else, uh, and the local communities also. So there was no agreement between the, 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 the negotiators. It's at that moment that um, we came in, we being a consortium of uh, different bodies, academics and non-academics, as you can see all the logos here, we had developed a game in a completely different line of thought, uh, looking at the interaction between mining and logging in Central Africa. Now, this is part of the project and the model we had designed was created, mind, was called Mindset. So we offered FSC to use Mindset as a support for their ongoing negotiation process. That game had been designed with experts from the field. Um, um, for example, the lady that you can see here in red, uh, Madame Rosalie Matando is currently the Minister of uh, uh, Forest Economy um, in, in her country. So, and we had people from the mining industry, people from the logging industry, people from uh, representatives of the local communities designing and building the game with us, a bit like uh, Jean Christophe and, and Christine have presented. Um, and we had tested these with academics. Uh, so, it was a, a model we knew would be actually useful for, for FSC. Um, essentially, it contains all the elements that are relevant to the discussion. And a game session looks like what you see on the screen right now. What you see is one full day of workshop where people play the role of logging companies, make decisions about where to develop their infrastructure, where to log, how to negotiate with the governments, with the World Bank or with the other logging companies, and then they shape the landscape in doing so. The interest of the game is that then people can use these to discuss the strategies, the landscapes they have created, um, the social, economical, and environmental impact of the decisions. It's a complex game, but it's a game that reflects a reality on the ground. And um, so we invited FSC to use that game. They accepted, they, they said, okay, fair enough, we're going to try that because we need a new approach to decision-making. And we invited the 12 negotiators and FSC to, to, to sit at the table and forget everything that they had done for two years, just for, for one day. They, we said, you have positions, you've been already um, discussing, that's okay, forget everything, and now let's just play the game. And for one day, they played the game. We, just, we were just facilitating. 
On the second day, they established bridges between the game and what had happened in the game and what was outside, what they knew from the situations they were in. That was for the second day. And on the third day, we got an agreement. And that shows you the power that games can have in helping people with different interests reach agreements. Why it works? Simply because the game represents a first step of the agreement. People playing the game say, yes, the, world's, the world works like that. And on that basis, we can build agreements and negotiate uh, um, because we understand each other much better. Um, and it was not just something that was done during the workshop. We, we just, we, we left out of the system and they continued the discussion with FSC and they had every negotiator had to report back to the hierarchies and everything. And so there were still negotiations going on, but the agreement had been, had been uh, decided and defined during these three days of the workshop. In April this year, the agreement was signed by all parties and will now dictate until the rules change again, how FSC certified concessions will deal with intact forest landscapes. So I don't know what the future of these forests will be, but one thing I know is that we have changed the future thanks to the game. Um, and this is actually what we want to do with these approaches and with these games. We want people that are better able to deal with complex issues, with in divergent interests, with uncertainty. We, we help people take better decisions today about the future tomorrow. We actually empower them through the gaming approach. In the village, through uh, at the entire community level, or really at the regional level, nothing restricts this approach to the village. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Claude. A very impressive example uh, you showed us. Um, now the floor is again open to submit questions. So maybe before the questions are coming in, I would have a, a first question to start. Um, so you were saying that um, FSC with their partners uh, managed to find an agreement so what were the most, um, how to say, what was new in this agreement or what was kind of, what were the triggers um, solved by your game or, or what made the difference then in the end to reach the agreement? Okay, the, the, I can identify a series of steps and maybe others were uh, present, but I, I, I did not become aware of that. But there was a, a first clear trigger during the first day when we were playing the game, um, the players are put in the, in the shoes of the CEO of a logging company, right? So everybody was playing that role. The government representatives, the people from the conservation NGOs, everybody was playing the role of a logging company. And then two things happened at the end of the day. First, the people from the logging company said, yes, this is, these are the constraints we're working under. This game reflects what we're going through and the difficulties we're facing. So they recognized and validated the model and the others said, oh, now I understand you better. So that, that was for me a very important milestone, understanding each other better and the feeling of, yes, now the others, they understand me better. So I will no longer need to be fighting against them in negotiation, but we can start working together to find a solution. That was the first milestone. The second milestone was achieved at the end of the second day where, um, and that was nothing to do with the game, but everything to do about how people talk and how people listen. Thanks to the fact that we were facilitating and, and we were accepted as facilitators, we, we actually forced people to present the opinion of the other parties. So at the end of the day, so, they had three chambers, an economic chamber, a social chamber, and an environmental chamber. That's how the, the, the group was structured. So to continue on the discussions, the economic chamber had to present the position of the environmental chamber. The environmental chamber had to present the position of the social chamber, and the social chamber had to present 
the position of the economical chamber. So we, we ask them to play the role of the champions of the other side, again, mm -hmm. contributing to the fact that they wouldn't understand each other. And the last and final milestone was that we, 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 um, we identify, we, we reach, we build the agreement step by step. Instead of trying to, to secure an agreement about everything, we started saying, what are the all possible cases that exist in the Congo Basin? Uh, and do we have some on which the decision is easy and we can agree? Yes, okay, that is agreed. Here also, then that is agreed. So we were collectively building together the agreement with the easy things first and letting the difficult things for the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It sounds very impressive, kind of the change you were able to trigger. So now I would like to call for more questions. Uh, so far, it's silent if I... If I'm correct, um, you were so clear. <laughs> okay, I see. I will just give a few seconds if some more people want to submit. If, if there's no question, I do have a comment. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, it's ahead. actually a comment. It's actually a comment that was uh, I received this this morning. Um, um, how can you still say this is a success if the agreement is bad for the forest? That's a question that has been asked to me this very morning. Um, and then and then and then the answer for that is actually quite simple. What 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 we did and what we wanted to do, our objective was not to save the forest. Our objective was to help a group of stakeholders, of people, to get to an agreement. Anybody that was not part of the agreement will have an opinion on the agreement. Some people will say this is good for the forest, others will say it's bad. And that's what was preventing the group to reach agreement to begin with. Everybody had an opinion on the system. But what I know is that the participants in that process stopped talking about opinions and started talking about how the system actually works. Our success is not based or measured on how many intact forest landscapes um, will be maintained in the future. Our success is on the fact that we have created a community that is working together and reaching to agreements. Maybe tomorrow we will find out that the agreement is not good, but the group will be able to work on it and refine it. This is the uh, yardstick by which this process should be measured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So I would propose uh, we move on to the, we have now a panel uh, discussion or the, the general discussion with all the panelists and there we can still submit the uh, questions then also for Claude uh, specifically. Um, so to kick off the discussion, I would like to invite all the three panelists to make a statement about their respective topic, which they presented in a way also a, like a take home match message for the audience. So I would like to invite uh, Christine first. Um, and I think you have a, a slide to share. So I ask Lauren to make that slide visible. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> well, it's nice to, to get another chance as a presenter to again take forward uh, what was the message of the talk. And um, I guess it's, um, yeah, my. My experience is um, in designing games is that it's very important to know what you would like to have from that game in that specific context. So defining the purpose of a game is essential whenever using it as a tool. So it's a tool that is um, um, useful for many things, but it's really essential to decide which game to uh, to select for which purpose. And what it was in the multi-scale gaming, uh, multi gaming approach is that I would like to just stress this a bit that it uh, serves most of 
most of it the transfer of knowledge uh, from different stakeholder groups and across different scales. So how we did that is it that we used it for us to establish our system understanding first. So that's what I mean here with SU is system understanding. That was done by by the, the building process and the uh, playing of the local games. So this was uh, kind of helping us to collect um, knowledge of ourselves more or less with inputs from all the stakeholders that we have been uh, interacting with with focus group interviews and in the in the games themselves. And then we used a game for a very different purpose. So uh, for helping us to synthesize and to operationalize our system understanding. That was the building phase of the of the meta game, and then playing it is uh, um, helping us to share it and to. Um, sorry about this. I just have to move this a bit. Um, so to share it and to and to test it. That system understanding. So it is. I cannot go back, but I'm anyways at the end of it. So very important to decide for what is the purpose of the game in this particular part of a methodology or in this particular part of co-production of knowledge because it's um, still like a tool and it's not a, an, an end in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now I would give the floor to Jean-Christophe, to the second speaker we had, to share his take-home message or statement. So I also have one slide. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, it's up. Yeah. Um, so what I like to to say to summarize uh, is that uh, we we know now that serious game have have uh, qualities, uh, good qualities that we have demonstrated to engage local populations. Uh, uh, it's what I, I have presented, and, and uh, multi-stakeholder groups. Uh, it's more what uh, uh, Claude presented in, in uh, uh, higher-level decisions and in transformative approaches. Uh, but if we want to, to generalize these uh, approaches, we still have some pending uh, questions uh, and, and some conditions that should, should be uh, uh, fulfilled. And uh, one is if you want to, we want to, to reach this facilitation expertise and, and to make it uh, largely uh, available. Uh, we, we need to engage in a massive training of, uh, of uh, local staff or partners, colleagues uh, on those uh, approaches uh, so that they, uh, we avoid uh, uh, problems some other methods uh, uh, had in, in, the, in the past that uh, uh, through process of um, simplification of the method were kind of denaturated, and at, at the end, you, 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 we, we may lose this uh, this critical thinking that is necessary for a facilitator to to uh, to to, to uh, meaningfully uh, do the job. Um, then, in in some case, this would uh, engaging with the the world community. That was one question that was uh, was asked earlier. Uh, would uh, require to combine with uh, other tools. Uh, Sometimes, when when you have uh, um, uh, engaged through the game into the community, it's what also uh, uh, Claude presented. You don't need the game anymore because uh, uh, people are, are uh, able to uh, to talk to each other. And, and you, you can move on to other other tools or other other ways to facilitate the meaningful interactions. To that end, for example, we are using participatory theater to inform larger uh, uh, number of people. And there are a number of uh, of methods that will develop uh, in the in the future from this uh, uh, this uh, range of uh, tools that have been uh, uh, developed and pushed forward by the uh, um, um, companion modeling uh, community. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the idea. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So now I would like to give the floor to our third speaker, to Claude. Do you also have a slide to share? Yep. Yeah. And I think you see it now, right? Yes, um, yes. But I have, but then I have a comment because um, 
Jean-Christophe introduced a new a new word that I don't think we used before, and that's serious games. Mm, I, why do we use serious games? Honestly, it's because if I go to the World Bank or if I go to the French Development Agency and I tell them you need to play a game to manage better your job, they laugh at me. And I think Jean-Christophe and Christine, you know this, this. Whenever we bring this method to people with power, with seniority, and with a lot to, to you know, a reputation, simply, you know, kids are for, your games are for kids, and this is serious business, you know, grow up. Um, so then, the, but it is a game. So then we say, okay, it's, you know, it's a serious game. <laughs> um, I defend the fact that they, our games are not serious. You saw the picture I sent you at the end of my presentation, people have a smile that big. And this is what is actually needed to create innovation. You want to, you know, you want to fuel the spark that people have inside. Who wants to play a serious game for one full day? I don't, not even for one hour. So I defend the fact that our games are fun. They are about serious topics, but they're, they're fun. And fun is actually necessary part of the learning process. That's one, just one comment, but that's a personal crusade. Um, the lesson I take from this, um, I know and for a game, games can be useful, but you need four ingredients if you want to actually change things on the ground. Uh, the easiest one, the ones where we have expertise, the game in itself, the model, we know how, how to design. We've been doing that for, for almost 20 years now. We know how to design games that are, that are engaging, that reflect the constraints people are under, that uh, have enough surprise to be interesting. So games is the easy part, we know how to do it. Facilitation, as Jean-Christophe said, is critical because we need to train people to listen. Uh, we need to, you cannot just give the game and say, go on and have fun. It doesn't work like that. You need to have people that help communities, that help decision makers to engage and have a meaningful discussion after the game is played. But that's still okay, that's still under control. The important thing is the players. If you bring uh, school kids to my game session, well, these school kids will learn a lot, but if they end up, uh, I don't know, working as um, you know, in a completely different field, that knowledge will not translate to change the landscape. If I'm working with the people that are transforming the landscape or the people that are making decisions that will transform the landscape, then I have the potential to change the system. But the most, you know, the big bottleneck, the big bottleneck is finding the convener. The person that will say, yes, we are going to use a game because it's important for us to help think better the future. And yes, I will convince the, govern, the governor of the province, I will convince the CEO of the company to come and sit at the table with me. And it takes a lot of courage to find people like that. In our case, we were lucky. The, the, the program for the Congo Basin, Mathieu Schwarzenberg, accepted to play that role. If anybody in the audience has power, please consider, do not brush aside games if you are dealing uh, um, with, with wicked problems. Um, we need more conveners. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A very a strong statement. Um, so now actually we would still have a few more minutes to again open the floor for the audience. So please, if you have a burning question still to our three speakers, don't hesitate to type it in. And if you want to ask a question to a particular uh, speaker, please also mention the name. So let's see if uh, some final questions are coming in. So if anybody of you, uh, of the speakers, still wants to use this time <laughs> for another strong statement, please, the floor is open. Maybe I can ask Claude something, if that's mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, uh, please. Well, I've been. Uh, Busy with how do you get to a game design, right? And in the case um, of uh, mindset, so can you tell us a little bit of how the co-design process worked in particular? Um, you showed a picture on um, what kind of methods did you use in order to arrive at a at a at a game design that you then used further on? Uh, 
So what we did is a series of workshops. They, these workshops were um, distributed over a period of two years because it was very difficult to rope the people in the same room for one day. Um, we had the first workshop simply asking 15 different people, um, first identifying these people was already a task in itself. But then once we had them, asking them, so what are the issues uh, related to the development of mining in the Congo Basin. And then they would populate an entire wall with issues going from uh, security issues to health, uh, to to the impact of roads. And, and then we, we then ask these people, these experts, if you want to say, okay, and then who are the actors? What are the resources involved? How is this interconnected? We essentially follow the, the RD methodology, which is familiar to the companion modeling community. Are these standing for actors, resources, dynamics, and interactions? And then, and then it was a process of you digesting the information uh, here in the lab, trying out uh, different forms to represent that into a game. Um, the players, the actors becoming the players, the resources becoming the board, the tokens, the interactions, and the processes becoming the rules. And then going back, another workshop, trying out. No, it doesn't work. Okay, go back to the design board. And it took it took a it, it took a while. It took a while. Thanks, Kay. Thank you. So we got one question, um, and I think it's addressed to Claude. Is there an example of serious game management that let the local communities really take decision on their landscape? and that these decisions cannot be modified without consulting them afterwards. Well, I, I think that John Christophe presented well, such an example uh, to some extent. Um, I, I can give another example. We, we are working on a, on a project funded by uh, the, the Swiss SNF. The project is called OPAL, and it deals with oil palm uh, development in Colombia, Indonesia, and Cameroon. Um, so we started in Cameroon, we designed a game to understand the, the supply chain in Cameroon and how it's organized. One of the outcomes of uh, playing this game in the field with the small growers and the industry, the, the industrial mills that uh, buy the fruits of the palm uh, to, to crush and make oil, is that the contracts signed between the industry and the smallholders have changed. People have understood that if uh, if one party or the other abuses of its power in the negotiation, it is actually detrimental detrimental to everybody. So this is for me an example of a decision taken. It's not by villagers. It's by villagers interacting with uh, uh, you know private companies, and and they are better off. That's an example, and nobody can go back then uh, to the former forms of contracts because they have better deals now. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So I can see time is running and we have unfortunately uh, to come to an end. So um, I would like to give the word to Jean-Christophe for a short wrap up of the webinar. Please, Jean-Christophe. Thank you. Um, there is not not much to uh, to add to to what was uh, was was discussed. What we wanted to do was to to provide a range of uh, application of uh, uh, role play game, um, and I think the the, the tree presentation did capture uh, di different contexts where role play game can be uh, can be used. Um, one one thing uh, that is important uh, also is that a role play game must be fun even though we call it serious uh, a game sometimes to to please uh, the the, the uh, organizers uh, um, we have identified uh, uh, key roles in uh, uh, following up this uh, process, uh, which are the, the facilitators, and we need a massive uh, training of facilitators uh, to uh, um, get into this uh, process in the future. 
and um, conveners as well as uh, a Claude as, as presented. Um, I see that Claude, you would like to, to uh, present some results, right? No, no, I think. Uh, if you <laughs> give me the floor, I will start for two hours. Uh, no, I was, yeah, I was yeah, reading yeah. on no, the I chat. Well. <laughs> okay. Um, one other thing is that a, a question that we are, are asked very often is uh, about uh, power imbalance. Uh, power imbalance is a, is, is a real uh, uh, issue, and, and we uh, showed in, in the different presentation how we deal with that uh, with that process. But we could uh, show, and that was the the last comment from uh, from Claude that uh, in some case. Uh, um, um, small orders could uh, manage and negotiate through the game with uh, uh, um, um, the company uh, could manage to uh, to, to reorganize an agreement so i think um, we somehow uh, capture a great deal of of uh, um, aspects uh, related to uh, to our topic today and i i hope in the next uh, in the in the comments you will do uh, i i understand that there, there will be a, a survey afterwards and in in, in yes, comments will, can, can still be provided uh, i will come I, to that I, yeah i will over come to, to isabel now yeah okay thank you very much um so I would like to come to the closing of this webinar. And first of all, I would like to thank our three speakers and also the audience um, who provided um, questions. And as Jean-Christophe already mentioned, we would like to invite you um, to participate in a really short survey. Um, it's just about uh, to hear how you like this webinar. And Lauren will send out um, an email with the link to all of you. So it would be great to get your feedback. And the presentations and also the recording of this webinar uh, will be shared and available on the GLP website. And we will actually also answer the questions which we could not, uh, we were not able to answer all of them. So also that will be posted on the website. And just as a reminder, if you are not a um, member of the GLP Working Group on Co-Production, we would like to invite you to become a member in case you're interested uh, to join uh, that group. And to conclude, uh, just again an outlook on the next uh, webinar series. So on 1st of November, we will have a webinar about modeling and scenario building and forecasting. And on the 4th of December, we will have a webinar on the use of spatial tools. So we would be happy if uh, you participate again to those webinars. Uh, more information about them will be shared uh, shortly through the emailing list. So thanks again uh, to everybody and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>